Good morning, Cam Brewer for Cam's Mortgage Minute on Tuesday, October 2nd. Hey, I posted a video on Friday uh, whether you should buy now or buy later, and I got a lot of responses on that, and I got some emails that were pretty interesting as well. One of the ones I got was talking about the fact that CMHC should get out of the mortgage business altogether, and because they're in the mortgage business, it's causing housing prices to be inflated, it puts taxpayers at risk, and uh, you know, if suddenly a whole bunch of people started defaulting. Points that are very hard to argue. I mean, let's face it, uh, if CMHC defaulted there, or I mean borrowers started defaulting, CMHC would be a risk, which means us as taxpayers are at risk. But on the flip side, what we have to look at is what does CMHC do and what do they provide? And they do provide basically security to lenders that the government is in there and that they should be lending in situations where let's say there's a 5% down payment requirement. Now, what if uh, like this uh, emailer had sent to me that CMHC were to pull out of all together. Well, let's look at some of the consequences of that if that were to happen. If all of a sudden CMHC said tomorrow, hey, we're out of that market, we're not insuring mortgages anymore, first thing we'd all see is tumbling house prices. There's no doubt about it. If all of a sudden you take 35 to 40 percent of the people out of the market, which is the number of people that typically get insured mortgages, they're not buying anymore. And if they're not buying anymore, that's a huge chunk of the population. Uh, the Canadian Association of Accredited Mortgage Professionals did a report in the spring saying that if even 5%, uh, basically if 5% more was required in a down payment, that would take 100,000 people out of the market. Well, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that 15% more is going to do a lot more. Now, for those of you who uh, I, in the blogs talk about the market cratering and uh, seem to have be ambivalent to it, uh, that would essentially mean that there would be a $52,000 savings across the board on the average house in Canada. Uh, that's what a 15% additional correction could mean, a 15 percentage point drop in the value. Uh, that would mean a savings of $250 a month on the monthly payment that somebody's making. So hey, I guess that's the positive side of it, but except for the fellow who owns that house that he's just lost 52000 The economic fallout would be pretty much broad-based. It wouldn't just be in one segment. Uh, when you look at it, one-fifth of Canada's economic production can be traced back to housing and related spending on housing. So falling prices and levels of home ownership would obviously slow economic activity. Uh, what does that mean and translate into? Fewer jobs. That's right. Almost one in six new jobs are construction related. So we've got less jobs. We're going to obviously lower the wages because you know what? People can't afford to, uh, you know, there's more competition, more people looking for work. You can afford to pay them less. More mortgage defaults and basically consumers are going to spend way less. Does that mean that would last forever? No. Over time, I'm sure the economy would adjust. The question is how much time and how much pain is going to be incurred along the way. Now, one bright light in all of this is it may start forcing Canadians to start saving money. Those of you who follow my Mortgage Minute know that I rant about this all the time, that folks should be saving money and they should be putting money away for a rainy day. Higher rents. Well, that's an inevitability. If all of a sudden less people are able to qualify due to the new rules, in essence that there's no more government backed mortgages, uh, that means more people got to rent. And if there's more people looking for rent, there's more competition, which means you can charge more for rent. Of course, that wouldn't last forever. Over time, it's going to find its own happy medium, and that's going to change. Longer wait times. Folks aren't going to be flipping out of houses quickly, and other folks are going to be waiting a long time to buy. If it takes about three to five years for most people to save 5%, you can imagine it's going to take a lot longer to save up that additional 15 and hit to that 20% mark. So that means it's going to be dozens of years of waiting and folks will probably be in their mid-30s, late-30s before they ever decide on buying a house. Of course, during this time, they'll be renting and they won't have any capital appreciation if there is any in the market. But others would argue that they're also not paying interest. They're also not incurring property taxes, condo fees, whatever. But the bottom line is that they are still paying rent during that time period. That doesn't uh, go anywhere. Lower insurance costs. Obviously, if the insurer is out of the business, the average mortgage is going down. I mean, the average insurance fee is anywhere from five to ten thousand dollars. So those are not being capitalized into mortgages anymore. So that's certainly going to be a plus on that front. Anyway, I've got quite a few more points which I'm going to carry with you tomorrow, and it's just food for thought. I'm not saying that they should do this or do that, but what I do uh, want to point out is that we should look at all the consequences when something changes. It's easy to say, well, if the market crashes, hey, it doesn't affect me, it's not going to have much of an impact, but it affects all of us. 
Uh, some of us may be on the sidelines wanting to buy, wanting to jump in, and we see that as a positive, but there are other ramifications of such things. So we'll pick that up tomorrow on part two, and I will see you tomorrow.